In this video, we're going to practice the structural approach to acidity and basicity comparisons, engaging the stability factors and looking at differences in acidity between protons within one molecule. And this same logic can be applied to protons in multiple molecules if you're looking for the most acidic proton, for example, in a series of related molecules. And then we'll see how to choose an appropriate acidic or basic reagent to protonate a particular position if we're talking about choosing an acid or deprotonate a particular position if we're we're talking about choosing a base, and the same ideas come into play. We're just considering the relative stabilities of typically reactant and product ions or hypothetical conjugate acids or conjugate bases as we do this, engaging these stability factors. And to remind you what those are, we have charge and the position, the atom type where charge appears. We have resonance stabilization, hybridization, and inductive effects. And we also have steric effects and solvation, which is not going to be relevant directly to this video and to the vast majority of acidity basicity comparisons you make, but it makes for a nice acronym, dyslexic crisp. Okay, so in this example problem, we're looking at the highlighted protons in each molecule and deciding which of the two highlighted protons is more acidic, justifying our choice using one of these stability factors. And the first thing we want to notice is that all of these compounds, all of the atoms in these compounds are, are neutral. And so we're thinking about neutral acids. And so what we want to do is imagine removing a proton, removing that highlighted hydrogen as a proton and considering the anionic conjugate bases that are generated as a result. So let's practice that with the first molecule that you see here. So removing that proton on the left produces this ion. Notice that we've gone from an OH, to, uh, which is neutral, to an anionic O minus here. Let's do the same thing to the other OH group of interest over here, and we get a different O minus on the other side of the molecule. Now, to begin to compare these two conjugate bases, let's focus on what's going on in the vicinity of each negative charge. And let's start with the negative charge here. What do I notice? Well, let's start with the charge, the atom type where the charge is located. It's O minus in both cases. So there's no difference in the electronegativity or atomic size of the atom that's bearing the charge, at least in these Lewis structures. Now let's move down to resonance delocalization. Is either of those charges affected or, or shifted by resonance delocalization? Well, if we focus on this, we'll notice we have a lone pair connected by a single bond to a CO double bond. We've got an allylic lone pair type situation going on in this anion on the left. And we can draw curved arrows to show the delocalization of that lone pair of electrons. And that leads to a resonance structure where the whole right-hand side of the molecule is exactly the same. And what's different here is the location of that negative charge and, and the pi bond, right? And what this shows is that the negative charge is actually spread out over both oxygen atoms in this functional group, which is known as a carboxylate. It's the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. So this molecule has resonance stabilization, resonance delocalization, if you like, of the negative charge. That's going to be a huge stabilizing factor here. And now what we want to do is check for resonance in the other position of interest, resonance in this conjugate base where we've deprotonated at the other position of interest. Do we have any resonance here? Well, we do not because there's a saturated carbon directly connected to that oxygen atom. There's no resonance delocalization here. What this ion does have, which may be worth noticing, is inductive stabilization of the negative charge with a Cl3C group here, trichloromethyl group here, and the nearby carbonyl group. Both of these are electronegative groups stabilizing that negative charge through an inductive effect. They're actually sharing some of the negative charge via polarization of the sigma bonds is how we would think about this. But that inductive effect is further down the list, right? It's, it's further down the list in terms of the impact or significance of our stability factors. And so it's a weaker effect, and that makes this ion less stable despite the inductive effects than this ion, which is benefiting from resonance stabilization. And now we think about the conjugate seesaw and the logic of acids and their conjugate bases to reason about which original acid is more acidic. This conjugate base is more stable than this conjugate base. That means this original acid is more acidic 
than this original acid. So the more acidic group here is the carboxylic acid group. This is the more acidic proton, thanks to resonance stabilization in the conjugate base. In this second example, we're interested in two protons that are right next to each other inside this cyclic structure. And again, we're dealing with two neutral atoms bearing the protons of interest. And so what we should do is deprotonate, remove those protons, and consider the conjugate bases that are generated in turn going down the list, comparing them on where the charge is located, their resonance delocalization, hybridization, and inductive effects, and so on and so forth. So first, let's generate the conjugate bases by removing a proton at each of those positions. If we remove that right-hand proton, we get to this conjugate base. Notice that loss of this proton has led to a negative charge and a new lone pair there, and I went ahead and added in the implied hydrogen that's located at that position as well, which we can see right here. If we deprotonate at the other position, well, we can imagine that happening through electron flow like this, and we're going to get negative charge and a new lone pair at this carbon here with no hydrogens left at that carbon. That's worth noting at this point. All right, so now we're comparing the two conjugate bases on the stability factors. First, charge. Well, in both structures, we've got negative charge on a carbon atom, so no difference in electronegativity or atomic size at those carbons. And so we're going to move down the list to resonance delocalization. Now, what's going on with resonance delocalization? Well, we'll notice in this molecule on the right, we have a lone pair adjacent to a carbon-nitrogen double bond we have an allylic lone pair situation going on here, kind of analogous to the situation that we saw up here. And so we can push electrons like this to generate an alternative resonance form where the negative charge has moved from carbon to nitrogen. So we've got resonance stabilization in this conjugate base on the right. That negative charge is delocalized over carbon and nitrogen, and that's a stabilizing effect. What about resonance in the molecule over here? Well, if you're attuned to these structural patterns that give rise to resonance, you may notice that this retains the carbon-nitrogen double bond, and that is a polarized pi bond. We can imagine pushing the carbon-nitrogen double bond electrons up to nitrogen here. This would generate an alternative resonance form in which the negative charge shifts over to nitrogen. And you may wonder, is this a significant alternative resonance form? The answer is not exactly. While it's certainly okay to do this, we're creating a carbon in this alternative resonance form that looks a little bit problematic. For example, we have this lone pair here that's, that's localized. So the lone pair that was actually generated in removing this proton, right, these bonding electrons became this lone pair, is actually, it's a localized lone pair, right? This is sitting in an sp2 hybrid, and the lone pair itself is not a resonance active lone pair. The bigger issue, I'd say, is that that carbon has no octet, right? It has a deficiency of electrons, fewer than eight electrons. And while we've said that that's, generally speaking, okay, for example, in a carbocation, for carbon to have less than an octet of electrons, here we've got a carbon not with three bonds, but with two bonds and a lone pair. We could say carbon in the, in the plus two oxidation state on some level. This is what's known as a carbene, and ultimately that's going to make this a relatively minor contributor. And in a comparative sense, and this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of comparing this resonance form to this alternative resonance form within their respective compounds, this resonance form is way, way less of a contributor than this resonance form is. And so the stabilization of negative charge is much less in this molecule on the left than it is on, on the molecule on the right, which has really true and, and much more impactful delocalization of the negative charge. And so because there's much more resonance stabilization in this anion with the charge genuinely shared between carbon and nitrogen, the molecule on the right, the conjugate base on the right, is more stable than the conjugate base on the left. And applying the conjugate seesaw logic, this proton is going to be more acidic than this proton. This proton here is, is basically a plain vanilla carbon sp2 you know, CH, um, whereas this proton here is essentially allylic. It's, it's sort of allylic plus, right, with this nitrogen stabilizing the negative charge that develops in the conjugate base. 
So this has given us a sense of how we can apply these structural stability factors to reason about acidity without ever touching pKa values. And of course, we could, we could go look up or try to calculate pKa values for these protons and we would come to the same conclusions, but this kind of reasoning is really generalizable. And I like to make this point because you'll be using these kinds of arguments to reason about, for example, the relative stabilities of anions really throughout your time studying organic chemistry. So what we talk about here is going to transcend acid-base reactions. We can also apply the structural stability factors to choose an appropriate acid or base to protonate or deprotonate an organic compound, for example, a substrate of interest, typically in the midst of a chemical reaction. So we'll often want to use a strong acid or strong base to, for example, turn a neutral molecule into a cation or anion by adding or removing a proton. And we'll talk about, about those reactivity patterns later in the course. What we want to understand for now is how we recognize and understand and rationalize that a particular acid or base is actually strong enough or is not strong enough to protonate or deprotonate a particular molecule. And the logic we've developed thus far with the structural stability factors allows us to do this. And the key general idea is that acid-base equilibria that involve a net charge, which is very typical in organic reactions, we often use reagents with an ion that has net charge as an acid or base, those equilibria are going to favor the side with the more stable charge. And this is kind of a, a particular example of the idea we saw previously that acid-base equilibria favor the side with the weaker acid or the weaker base. It's the exact same idea. The more stable charge is associated with the weaker acid or base. So we can conclude whether a given base can deprotonate a given acid or vice versa by applying the structural stability factors. And let's do that with two examples here. So in the first example, we have this compound, which is phenol. And in particular, we're interested in the OH proton of phenol, which is the most acidic proton. If you think about charge and atom type and electronegativity, you'll be able to recognize that. We're interested in deprotoning phenol with hydroxide, OH minus. And here we want to know, is sodium hydroxide a suitable base for the deprotonation of phenol? In other words, will this reaction kind of work as advertised? Is it favored in the forward direction? So we, what we need to decide is, which of these two ions is more stable? The product ion, this phenoxide anion, or the starting material or reactant ion, OH minus? Okay, so how do we think about this? Well, one thing we can notice is that in the product ion, we've got resonance structures. We've got resonance delocalization of this lone pair, allylic lone pair again, right? So we can push electrons like this to show the delocalization of charge onto this carbon. And these carved arrows give rise to this resonance structure. And this is a great opportunity to pause and verify those carved arrows if you need more practice with resonance. Now, this is not the only alternative resonance form of this anion. There are several others. And again, it's a good opportunity if you need to or want to, to pause and draw out the other resonance forms of this anion. There's a lot of resonance delocalization going on in this anion. Hydroxide, just a plain vanilla O minus, essentially, no resonance in that, right? And so lacking the resonance structures, OH minus is going to be less stable than the resonance stabilized phenoxide anion. Notice also that they're equivalent on the atom bearing the charge, at least in the immediate conjugate base, although we see that there are carbons that are sharing the negative charge in the phenoxide anion as well. So that sharing, that delocalization of charge makes the product anion more stable than the reactant anion. This means that the reaction is favored in the forward direction. The favored side has the more stable charge. And so yes, hydroxide is in fact a perfectly suitable base for deprotonating phenol, and this is pretty much an irreversible reaction with a pKa difference of about five between water and um, phenol. It's really about uh, between four and five, we would say, right? So the pKa of phenol is about 10, the pKa of water is 14, and so indeed the acid-base equilibrium favors the side with the weaker acid and the more stable charge. Two ways of saying the same thing, essentially. All right, in the second case, we have this anion with water. And the question now is we're kind of flipping the script. We've got an organic base 
and we're asking about water as an acid. Is, a water, is water a suitable acid to protonate acetylacetonate, which is this anion right here? The name's not super important. That's pretty much just a label for this molecule right here. Okay, so here again, we've got a net charge, net negative charge going on here, and we've got acetylacetonate with negative charge on the reactant side and hydroxide with the negative charge on the product side, and the question is, where is the charge more stable? Well, one thing we might notice is if we start at the top of the list and look at charge, I've got charge on a more electronegative oxygen atom in hydroxide than the carbon atom here in acetylacetonate. So we may stop and say, okay, charge is more stable on the more electronegative atom, so I'm going to stop there and say that this is a more stable anion than this, and I'm done, and yes, this reaction will work as advertised. But we should consider resonance here as well, because there may be some delocalization onto a more electronegative atom in acetylacetonate, and it's important to detect that, right, because we could have drawn this structure in a completely different resonance form with the charge on, for example, one of these oxygen atoms, and then we'd see there really is no difference in terms of the atom type, the, the type of the atom bearing the charge. And in fact, if we draw in the implied lone pair at that carbon between the two CO double bonds, we'll see that there is indeed an allylic lone pair situation going on in this ion, and there's resonance delocalization. So there's an alternative resonance form of this structure with negative charge on the oxygen atom. In fact, there's a third resonance form of this structure that puts negative charge on the other oxygen atom, and it's, again, a good opportunity to pause and draw that alternative resonance form and curved arrows leading to it. I'm about to reveal it, but again, it's, it's more great practice with resonance and multiple curved arrows, electron flow, depicting, depicting electron flow with curved arrows. All right, so let's reveal that third resonance form. What we can do essentially here is take a lone pair, push it back into a CO double bond, push the CC pi electrons over, and push these CO pi electrons up to oxygen, and the resulting structure has negative charge on the other oxygen atom in acetyl acetonate. So in fact, there is no difference in the types of atoms bearing the charge. If you look at these resonance forms, oxygen is sharing quite a bit of the negative charge in acetyl acetonate. And acetyl acetonate has resonance stabilization and hydroxide does not. So acetyl acetonate is more stable than OH- due to the additional resonance structures, the additional resonance delocalization in this anion. The reactant side has the more stable charge and so the reaction is actually favored in the reverse direction, not the forward direction. And, and here again, if you look at pKa's, this pKa is about 9, and the pKa of water is 14, so this is pretty much irreversible and complete in the reverse direction. In other words, hydroxide as a base can completely remove this proton right here. So no, water is not a suitable acid to protonate the acetylacetonate anion. Pretty remarkable. That means you could take sodium acetylacetonate, right, the sodium salt of, of this anion, and dissolve it in water, and there wouldn't be really any detectable proton transfer from water to that anion. Pretty remarkable for a carb anion, but notice, it's not really a carb anion. This is a highly stabilized carb anion with multiple alternative resonance forms.